Good afternoon. I uh, get the um, last slot of the day, so I'm hoping to put a little bit of wind in your sails and send you on your way with a bit of um, free energy. So uh, I'm going to start by telling you a story. This is probably my favourite ship in the world. She's called the Flying Cloud. She was built in 1850 as a direct response to commercial demand from the gold rush. Resources were required urgently from, Norway, uh, from New York to be taken to San Francisco in the shortest possible time. And so this ship combined the latest technology and knowledge and she broke the world speed record on her maiden voyage. She continued to break the speed record every single time she sailed. And the last time that she took the world sailing speed record was in 1854. And that record stayed for 109 years. And that's an extraordinary testimony to the technology in that vessel. And what happened was the Industrial Revolution, the internal combustion engine, came along and interrupted uh, the development of wind technology. And that's not a bad thing. I'm not complaining about that. We're all in this fantastic um, world that we live in now as a consequence of that. But we can't continue to rely on heavy fuel, fossil fuels, and so on. We've got to start to rethink the way we um, operate in the world. And uh, I think the Flying Cloud is a little bit more of a, a, a feature ship for me because her greatest record was set when she was being navigated by a woman, and I think that's a lesson that we could learn from. Let me introduce you to a fulmar. I don't know if there are any ornithologists in the room, but this is a fabulous bird. She has the ability to sail, 11, to, sail to fly 11,000 miles for lunch, get back to her nest, and have a net calorie gain at the end of it. And she does that through superb design and extraordinary knowledge of how to use natural systems of wind and currents. She uses more calories sitting on her nest than she does when she goes to work. And I think there are probably women in the room who can um, relate to that as well. Um, so I think what the point of understanding the fulmar is that we have a lot to learn. We think we've got to the extent of our knowledge and capability, and I don't think we've even scratched the surface yet. We've got the latent knowledge in all of the um, sailing technology that the flying cloud represents, and we've got to learn from nature. My own personal experience, I've worked in Formula One and yacht racing, but this is a particular interesting story that I experienced. I wasn't ever sailing in those sorts of conditions, but we were at Cowes one week. Uh, it was a beautiful summer's day. It was still uh, my sort of sailing day, by the way, so that you can not spill the gin, which I think is important. Um, and lots of other... So we were on this superb machine with lots of um, engine from the sails and a very, very super um, designed hull. And that vessel was able, that ship, that yacht was able to, to, to move through the water extraordinarily well, where other yachts at Cows on that particular day weren't able to move. So they would all beat their way over to us, and then we would be sliding away into the future. So it's about design. How do we design for the future? I think it's really important that we don't think that we're going to be designing the Cutty Sark or the Flying Cloud, and that whatever we look at now will be as different from a Model T Ford as a Tesla is. So we've got to be thinking about 21st century technology using traditional energy. And this is a particularly important um, slide to me because exactly the same energy is being used on the Dutch windmill as is now being used to power 12 megawatt offshore floating wind turbines. So let's not get stuck on the idea that we're going back in time. We're using modern materials and modern technology to harness free, abundant energy. 
So let me talk a bit about the environment, about engineering, and about economics, because I firmly believe that that's the most important thing that we need to be thinking about. When we think about environment, we think about it in two ways. There's either ecology, which I think is about natural systems. And in the Hellenic Centre today, interestingly, I think, the entomology of that word ecology comes from oikos, which is home or family. And that's what the ecology is for us. It's our home. Without, being, without looking after it, without caring for it, we will not be able to conduct commerce. So I don't think there's a trade-off between one thing and the other. I think we need to be smart. But I think really what we need to be doing is to be thinking about our commercial environment. And I'm not daft. We have a problem. Shipping has challenges, and I'm not suggesting that we can just wave a magic wand and everything's going to be wonderful. We've got a lot of challenges in the industry, and it contributes a significant chunk of global greenhouse gas emissions to the world. So what we can do in response to the impending regulation is to, as one of the previous panellists suggested, start to think now smartly about what it is we can do. So, so another panellist also mentioned that the finance industry is struggling to come to terms with how do we finance non-compliant or, or, or high, so, uh, high fossil fuel costing vessels. So let's not go, oh, well, it's somebody else's problem. Let's take a grip and make it our challenge and solve it. So engineering, as I said, worked in F1, worked in yacht racing. Engineering is not a problem if you ask the right questions of the right people. So this was one of our first of efforts, having done a little bit of research about what the industry might find useful. You can stick wind on any commercial ship, I get that. It's getting in and out of port that's probably quite difficult, and it's getting the cargo on and off that has its challenges. But if you ask the right questions of the right people, then you can find solutions. And that's what we're doing right now. We're working collaboratively across an ecosystem. And, spoiler alert, that's not what the end ver version of our rigs are going to look like, but I didn't want you to know, um, I don't want anyone to know until we do the proper reveal. But what we're doing is understanding from the ship owner's perspective what's going to work for them, understanding from a cargo owner's perspective what's going to work, taking that design brief back to really smart naval architects, marine engineers, mechanical engineers, and then putting it through LR, making sure it's safe, all of those good, solid engineering and commercial opportunity, or commercial things that we need to do. So, let's think about the economics of wind. Why would we go to all of this much trouble? It's not because we're tree huggers. It's not because we want to be green for the sake of it. I'm an economist. What really matters is the economy of wind. It's free. It's abundant. It's exclusively available to any vessel that's equipped to harness it. And I recognize that's not going to be every ship in the fleet, but it's a significant number, and it's retrofitable, and it's doable within the next 10 years. People will say to me, you can't predict the value of the wind. And I say you can, because we can do that through big data analysis, through digital systems, and I think it's probably, from the sound of previous um, uh, commentary, easier to predict the value of the wind than it is to predict the cost of any fuel as we move towards this 2050 horizon. Wind will always be free. So we need to design the tech to harness the maximum amount of it. And what that does is it significantly reduces the fuel cost burden for the ship owner or operator. Now, it's going to increase the capex, but it, insert, it puts certainty into the opex. And so what you then have the opportunity to do is to start being creative around the way the opex and the capex work together. We've seen how in the um, wind energy industry, all sorts of, and in the solar industry, lease, pa lease financing packages based on that certainty are available and um, being used to maximum commercial effect. 
So I think what we're saying is we're going to be able to hedge around the uh, uncertainty that worries uh, anybody in business. So, to summarize that, the cost of fuels, whether they're fossil or bio or anything else exotic that we might come up with, are tethered to commodity markets and they will be inherently volatile. The price of wind is only dependent on technology and we've seen over and over that innovations start at high cost and then they go down and down and down. We see it with wind, we've seen it with solar, we've seen it with mobile phones, we've seen it with laptops, with computers. We know that that's what happens. So we've got a win-win situation. We've got more cost certainty, and that gives the opportunity for businesses to better manage their future. We've got greater fuel autonomy, which reduces the risk for ship owners and operators, and that gives uh, a better ability to fix long-term charters. And by happy accident, it also happens to be clean. So if every sh suitable ship in the world could carry the wind at today's technology levels, we would see an overall reduction in greenhouse gas emissions of around 1%. So that's about half of shipping's 2050 problem. So I would urge us to not worry too much about all of the details and minutiae. Think big, think ambitiously, work together, be collaborative, and we can have a win-win-win future. Thank you very much.